Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, king size, extra mild and soothing, brings you Dragnet on both radio and television. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A young man walks into your office and tells you that his best friend has been killed by unknown assailants. Your job? Investigate. Friends, the name Fatima has always stood for quality. Fatimas are distinctive, with a truly different flavor and aroma. And in king-size Fatima, you get an extra mild and soothing smoke, plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Remember, in Fatima... The difference is quality. Because of its quality, its extra mildness, its better flavor and aroma, Fatima continues to grow in favor among king-size cigarette smokers everywhere. Switch to Fatima yourself today. Ask your dealer for Fatima in the bright, sunny yellow pack. King-size Fatima. The difference is quality. Dragnet. The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, August 9th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Warman. My name's Friday. It was 7.58 a.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. That you, Frank? Yeah, morning, Joe. Looks like it's going to be a scorcher today, doesn't it? Yeah, nice and clear. How'd the weekend go? Lousy. Why? What do you mean? Oh, Faye and me had a ruckus Saturday night. Was that so? Yeah, it happens every time we have somebody over for dinner. It never fails. Yeah. And she gets to yakking it up with the company. We never eat till 10, 10.30. It's a miserable time for dinner. Yeah, it's pretty late at that. Saturday night, we had the Johnsons over. Going to play a little cards, have a little dinner. You know, relax. Mm-hmm. Wife fixed Swedish meatballs. They're on the stove. Everything's dandy. She gets to talking. We finally sit down to eat. It's 10, 15. Meatballs are burned. Yeah. By that time, we're all so hungry, we lost our appetite. It was real embarrassing, Joe. We finally sat down. I figured let Faye know I was pretty sore. But I didn't want to come right out and tell her in front of the Johnsons, you know. Yeah, I understand. So I picked up one of the meatballs that was burned, said she'd invented something new. Everybody else used chlorophyll for their teeth, but we had built-in charcoal. Yeah, what would she say? Nothing. It's just a look. Hasn't said a word to me since. Sends the kids with messages for me. It's pretty miserable. Uh, she'll probably be over when you get home tonight. Pardon me. Yes, sir? Is the homicide department? We're in court of murder. Yes, sir, that's right. You think the fellas I talked to about a mother? Yes, sir. Come on in. Sit down. Take that chair over there. How they never make it? Are you all right? Yeah, now that I'm here, it's all right. Your face pretty badly cut there. Those bruises, scratches on your throat. You sure you're all right now? Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. I never thought I'd get here. Times I was ready to quit, but then I'd think of Kevin. What they did to him, and I, I had to keep walking. I had to. For Kevin, I had to. Well, everything's all right now. You can tell us about it. I don't know where to start. What's your name, young fellow? Bruce Hamilton. All right, Bruce. I'm Joe Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. Hello, Bruce. Hello. Well, we know that you must have been through a terrible ordeal, but you can tell us about it. It's all right. What day is today? It's Monday the 9th. Monday. And it was Saturday night. Just two days. Seems like ten years. We just finished dinner. Sitting around the fire having coffee, trying to figure out whose turn it was to do the dishes. Then we heard them. You heard them? Who's that? Horsemen. Lots of them. They rode right into the camp. One of them yelled something. They all stopped. Stood there looking at us. We didn't know what to do, who they were. We just stood there. Then this big guy, I, I guess he was the leader, said something to us in Spanish. We couldn't understand him. All right, go ahead. You see, Kevin and I go to school together. Summer vacation, we decided to go down to Mexico and do a little prospecting. That's the reason we were there. Mm-hmm. Go on. We just stood there and looked at him. Big guy said something else, and then they all laughed. And he got off his horse and came over to Kevin and me. He was a big man. When we tried to tell him that we didn't know what he was saying, he laughed and turned to the other men, and they laughed, too. 
Big guy said something else to them, and they all got off their horses and started to go through our things. Kevin told them not to and started to walk over to them to stop them. The leader hit Kevin and knocked him down. The men laughed at him, and Kevin got up and ran toward one of them. Kevin started to hit him. I broke away from the one that was holding me and ran to help Kevin. The big guy grabbed me and hit me in the face, knocked me down, started to kick me. I heard a shot. When I looked where Kevin was, he was all doubled up, holding his stomach. He hollered at me to help him. Then the guy shot him again. He fell down and didn't move. They all laughed, thought it was a big joke. I got up, one of them shot at me. I started running. I ran as fast as I could. He kept shooting. I thought, sure, they hit me, and I kind of waited for it. Then I ran through some bushes, and I fell into this gully. Mm-hmm. And at the bottom, I just lay there and didn't move, almost afraid to breathe. Guess they thought they'd kill me. I see. What happened then? I waited until I couldn't hear him anymore, and then I crawled up out of the gully to see if they were gone. I wanted to help Kevin. I didn't see anybody, so I walked over to where he was. He was laying on his face. He got no idea how I felt when I turned him over. Mm-hmm. All right, we understand. Go ahead. I knew right away he was dead. It shot him in the stomach and in the chest. The shirt was all stained. There was nothing I could do for him. Nothing anybody could do. I looked at him for a long time. I guess I cried. It was terrible. Kevin was dead and there's nothing I could do for him. I see. What'd you do then? I buried Kevin. I looked for something to dig the grave with, but they'd taken everything, even the shovel. Everything. I found a place under a tree and dug a grave with my hands. Then I went back and got Kevin. Laid him in the grave I dug and covered him up. Said a prayer for him. I did the best I could for him. Best I could. All right, son. Take it easy. Frank, let's get him some water. I'll take him down to the interrogation room, all right? All right. Bruce, maybe you'd like to go down the hall to another room. It's a little more quiet down there, huh? Yeah. So I cry like a kid. I guess you think it's silly, but I can't help it. No, it's all right, Bruce. We know how you feel. Nobody gets too old to cry. No, it's down this way. Okay. I'm so tired. I'm glad to get this over with. Sure. All right, here we are. Go ahead, Bruce. You want to sit down? Thanks. Here's your glass of water, Bruce. Thanks. It tastes good. Helps. All right. Now, is there any more you want to tell us? Well, there's a little more. There was nothing I could do. I, I looked around. They'd taken everything. Dishes, food, supplies, clothes. I went over the mesquite bushes where we hid in our duffel bag. We kept all our money and papers in there. Wallets, identification, all our valuables. They'd found that. It was gone. They hadn't left anything. Well, they took everything. Didn't leave a thing, huh? Not a thing. What'd you do then? Started to walk. We parked our car just off the highway. It was about five miles. When I got to where we'd park it, the, the car was gone. I didn't know what to do. What could I do? No. I started to walk down Sonata to tell the police. Then I began to think that the bandits had taken my wallet. I didn't have any identification, no way to prove who I was. Couldn't even speak the language. Got scared that they might not believe me. Now you walked all the way from Ensenada to the American border, is that it? That's right. I walked all Saturday night, and Sunday morning I found an old adobe house, and I crawled through a window and slept. I don't know how long I was asleep, but it was dark when I woke up. I started to walk again. I walked all Sunday night, too. When I got to the border, I was afraid to go through the gate, so I went down by the riverbed and found a hole in the fence. I crawled through and went over the American side. When I got there, I felt better. Safe. I figured that I'd go up to the first policeman I saw and tell him what happened. Did you notify the authorities down in San Diego? No, I... I got to the police station, but I didn't go in. I didn't tell them. Why not? Like I said, I didn't have any way to prove who I was. I had no money. My wallet was gone. My clothes were all torn. Face was all cut. I, I thought it'd be better if I could get to Kevin's mother. If I could see her and talk to her, she'd know what to do. I hitched a ride. I, I wanted to go to San Francisco. 
truck driver brought me this far. While we were driving, I thought more and more about what I'd say to Kevin's mother, how I'd tell her he was dead. And I knew I couldn't do it. But I had to tell somebody. That's why I came to see you. Now, Bruce, we're going to have to go back down to Mexico. You'll be able to show us where the body is, won't you? Well, if I have to go, I guess I can. But I can tell you exactly where it was. I, I can give you a map, tell you right where he's buried. Do you want to give us that information now? Yeah. It was south of Ensenada, 40 miles down the new paved highway. South of Ensenada, 40 miles. Are you sure it was 40 miles? Yeah. While we were driving, Kevin and I kept trying to figure out how many kilometers to a mile. I kept watching the speedometer. It was just 40 miles when we turned off the paved highway onto a little dirt road. 40 miles? Yeah. There's a clump of trees near there in the gully. You can't miss it. I see. Can you give us the description of the car, the license number? Well, I don't remember the license number, but the car was a 51 Ford sedan, dark blue. The car belonged to Kevin. I, I never paid any attention to the license. Mm -hmm. That's K-E-V-I-N, Kevin, huh? Yeah. Now we can check that through DMV. What was Kevin's full name and address? Kevin Allen Bradley. He lived at 6502 Washington Street, San Francisco. He lived with his mother, apartment on Knob Hill. Mm -hmm. Would you give us a description of Kevin? Well, he's about my size, generally. 5'10", 140 pounds, blue eyes. His hair's light, kind of blonde like mine, 22 years old. We looked a lot alike. Kids at school used to think we were brothers sometimes. I see. Joe, we better get a communication to the Mexican authorities, fill them in on the whole thing. Yeah. Tell them we're coming down. Yeah. Contact San Francisco and let them handle that end of the thing. Mm -hmm. Get a teletype off the DMV in Sacramento, get a license number on the car. We better contact the San Diego PD and get a hold of Al Gate and fill him in on the thing. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll stay here with Bruce. You want to take care of that? Mm-hmm. Now, look, young fellow, would you know these bandits again if you saw them? Why, I, I might not know some of them, but the big guy and the one that shot Kevin up, I'll never forget them. The big guy was tall, heavy, over six feet, well over 200 pounds. I'll never forget him. That laugh when he killed Kevin. When he laughed, you could see he had two gold teeth right here in front. These here. Two gold teeth, huh? Yeah. Now, how about the other man, Bruce? Did you get a good look at him? He was a small man, dark like the leader. He wasn't wearing a hat. Real thin face. His clothes were all dirty and his pants were torn around the bottoms. He was wearing those leather sandals, the open kind. His feet were filthy like he hadn't had a bath in a year. You think you'd be able to identify any of the others? Well, I don't know. Maybe if I saw him. I was scared and I don't mind admitting him. Joe? Yeah, Frank. I stopped by R&I before I went on with the other communications. Checked the name Kevin Allen Bradley through. Yeah. There's a teletype from San Francisco dated July 13th. It's a missing person report on Kevin. You want to read it? Mm, what's it say? Regular missing report? Well, it's described as male, white, American, 22 years, 5'10", 140 pounds, blonde, blue eyes, fair complexion. Time of disappearance was wearing a dark blue gabardine suit. Driving a dark blue 1951 Ford. License number 1, Robert 2951. Nothing else, Joe? Mm-hmm. He was known to be carrying a sum of money in excess of $1,500 when he disappeared. $1,500 is a lot of money, isn't it? Uh, not to Kevin. He was used to carrying that kind of money. You see, his folks were pretty rich. He, he always had all the money he wanted. Oh, I see. Well, how about this missing report here, Bruce? What do you mean? Well, didn't Kevin's mother know that he was going to Mexico? Well, no. You see, they had an argument about where he was going to spend his summer vacation. She wanted him to go to Canada, and he wanted to come down here. One afternoon, we just took off. Kevin went to the bank and got the money, and we just took off. I see. You didn't tell his mother anything about it? No, he thought that she'd try to stop him. Probably would have, too, if she'd known. Oh, was uh, the money among the things that were stolen from him? Well, yeah. It was in Kevin's wallet in the duffel bag. Mm -hmm. I suppose it was kind of foolish to leave that much money just laying around, but we did. We didn't think that anything had happened like this. Well, I stopped and think back over it. Kevin being dead, I, I don't know, I just get sick. Now, you say you didn't have any money. How did you get along? I didn't think much about food. The important thing was to tell somebody about Kevin's being killed. That's all I thought about, telling somebody. Yeah, sure. Well, you must be pretty hungry then. You'd like something to eat now, would you? Yeah, it might taste pretty good. Sandwich and some coffee. How about you guys? You gonna eat? Frank, how about you? Yeah, after I get communications off, I'll run across the street and pick up some sandwiches and coffee and bring them back here. All right, fine. What, what kind of sandwich you like, Bruce? No, oh, anything. Doesn't make any difference. Joe? Oh, ham's all right. White bread, a lot of mustard. You know. Okay, I'll be right back. All right. Oh, say, Joe, hmm. I'm running kind of low on my allowance. I only got a buck and a half. You got a little change? 
Yeah, sure, I'll... Uh... Now, here, let me get this. What's that? Huh? Did you say you had some money? Well, I have got ten dollars. Ten dollar bill. Well, maybe I'm wrong, but I thought you said the bandits took all your money. Did I get it wrong? Well, what I meant is I, I didn't think I had any money yet. I found this ten in my pocket just before I walked in here. Oh, I see, yeah. Look, you can see it's all wadded up. It must have been in my pocket for a long time. Just a ten all wadded up. Yeah, it's all crumpled up there. You can hardly tell what it is, can you? Yeah, that's right. But you can see it's a ten. Mm-hmm. Sure. It's all wrinkled up. You can see how I missed it. Yeah. I'll tell you, why don't you put everything in your pockets right here on the table, huh? Why? What'll that show? All right, come on, boy. I haven't got anything in my pockets. Well, you found the ten. Maybe you'll find something else. All right, but I don't know what it's going to show. Pocket knife, handkerchief, comb. You got the ten on the table there. That's all. Maybe there's something in your coat pocket. No, I don't carry anything in my coat pockets. Stretches them. Well, you take a look anyway, huh? I told you I don't use them. See? Nothing. How about the inside pocket? No. Well, there's nothing there. Let's have a look, huh? I told you there's nothing there. Then you won't mind if we have a look. What's that you got there, Bruce? Uh, that's my wallet. Guess they didn't take it after all. Gee, thanks for finding it. You know, I probably wouldn't have thought to look for it. I, I just figured that it was gone. Here, let me have it. Let's see what's in it, huh? Well, just some cards, personal stuff like that. Nothing you'd be interested in. I, I forgot all about it. I feel pretty silly. I didn't even know it was there. Take a look, mm -hmm. Joe. You say this is your wallet, is that right, Bruce? Yeah, it's mine. I, I told you it's mine. How about let me have it, huh? There's quite a bit of money in here, Bruce. Huh? I don't know, just a glance here. Looks to be about a thousand dollars, doesn't it? Well, just a minute. I, I think I can explain that. Well, there's another thing here I don't think you can explain. What's that? The name in the wallet, Kevin Bradley. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. Friends, the name Fatima has always stood for quality. Fatimas are distinctive, with a truly different flavor and aroma. And in king-size Fatima, you get an extra mild and soothing smoke, plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Yes, there's a good reason why Fatima continues to grow in favor among king-size cigarette smokers everywhere. In Fatima... The difference is quality. Quality of tobaccos. The finest Turkish and domestic varieties, extra mild and superbly blended to give you a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Quality of manufacture. Smooth, round, perfect cigarettes. Rolled in the finest paper money can buy. Quality even to the appearance of the bright, sunny yellow pack. Carefully wrapped and sealed to bring you Fatima's rich, fresh, extra mild flavor. So next time, insist on Fatima quality. Look for the bright, sunny yellow pack. Smoke Fatima, the extra mild and soothing king-size cigarette with the added protection of Fatima quality. With the finding of Kevin Bradley's wallet, the case had taken a new turn. We continued to question Bruce Hamilton, but he insisted that he thought the wallet and the money had been taken by the bandits when they killed the Bradley boy. While I talked to him, Frank went down the hall and contacted the Mexican authorities and gave them the information. He gave them the description of Kevin Bradley and of Bruce Hamilton. They told him that to the best of their knowledge, there were no bandits operating in the vicinity, but they would dispatch a search party to go over the area. They said they would keep us advised of any developments that might arise. Frank also contacted the San Francisco Police Department and gave them the information. They said they'd take care of that end of the investigation. 11.47 a.m. Frank came back to the interrogation room, and we continued to question the Hamilton boy. Well, I've told you all I know. I don't know how the money got there. I was as surprised as you were. I, I don't understand it. you got to believe me. Yeah, well, you're making it pretty tough to believe, Bruce. It's kind of hard to buy the fact that over $1,000 in Kevin's wallet turns up in your pocket, and you don't know how it got there. But it's the truth. I don't know how I can convince you that it's the truth. Well, there are a couple of other things that aren't clear here. What? Tell me. I'm not lying. I've got nothing to hide. What's not right? Tell me. Well, this business of not telling the authorities. I told you. I was scared that they might not believe me. You can understand that, can't you? Well, maybe up to a point. I thought that if I could get to Kevin's mother, then she could take care of it. I didn't know what else to do. Then when I got to L.A., I had a chance to think about it, and I couldn't go through with it. 
I couldn't tell his mother. I couldn't face her. Bruce, when you described where we could find the body, you said it was about 40 miles down the paved highway, that right? That's what I said. Well, how long has it been since you've been to Mexico? Well, I told you, I just came back from there. Don't you believe anything I've told you? Well, Joe and I just finished an investigation down in Mexico. Investigation took us about 70 miles south of Ensenada. We found the highway paved for only about five miles south. You say 40 miles. How do you explain the difference? Well, maybe I was wrong about the distance. Well, you're pretty sure when you first told us about it. Well, maybe I made a mistake. There's something else, Bruce. It's a little hazy here. I told you I want to help anything. How far south of Ensenada did you say you were? I said about 40 miles. Now I'm not sure. But you are sure that it was south of Ensenada. Well, yeah. And Kevin was killed on a Saturday night. That's right. And you started for the States right away. Well, that's what I said. I started walking as soon as I found the car was gone. And you walked all the way to the border. Well, that's right. How'd you walk? What route did you take? I told you. I stayed off the road. I was afraid of the bandits coming back. I, I walked along the roadside and then through the hills. I got off the roadside whenever I saw anybody coming. But you did walk all the way. Yeah, that's right. All the way from Ensenada to the border. And it took you how long? Well, Saturday night and Sunday night. I got a ride in San Diego in the morning. What time do you figure that you started for the border? Maybe 11.30, midnight. I don't know for sure. And you stopped at dawn? Well, yeah, I stopped and slept. Then I woke up and I started a walk. And you're asking us to believe that you walked over 100 miles in less than 14 hours. Is that right? Yeah. Through country like that? What do you think? That I'm making the whole thing up? Look at my face, my back. Here, look. Does this look like my imagination? You could have gotten these in a fight with Kevin. Maybe he didn't want you to take the money. You keep talking about the money. I try to tell you I don't know how the money got in my pocket. I don't know anything about it. You think I killed Kevin, is that right? Yeah, it looks that way, doesn't it? But he was my best friend. I had no reason to kill him. He was my friend. Now, look, son, we better get this thing straight for you. You've opened up a can of beans here. You waltz in here and give us a cock and bull story about this killing. Parts of your story we can't buy. Why are you trying to sell it to us? You lied about the road. You lied about the money. The story about how you walk doesn't ring true. You want to know what I really think, Bruce? I think the whole thing's a lie. From start to finish, a lie. Now, let's come off it. Who killed Kevin Bradley? I don't know. I don't know. Now, get this straight, Bruce. Did you kill him? Huh? Did you kill Kevin Bradley? Is that the reason for this story? No, no, I didn't. Well, somebody did. Can you tell us who? You're getting me all mixed up. You're the one that's getting it mixed up, Bruce. We just want to know who killed Kevin Bradley. We think maybe it was you. Looks like it might have been. No, no, it couldn't be. Leave me alone. I, I didn't do it. Why couldn't you have done it? Looks like you did. Because Kevin Bradley isn't dead. What's that? He was never killed. I'm Kevin Bradley. The boy broke down completely and admitted that the whole thing was a hoax. He said he hadn't been in Mexico at all, but that he'd spent the past week in a downtown hotel working out the story that he planned to tell us. He admitted that the wounds were self-inflicted. He explained that he had scratched his own face and hit himself with a rock to produce the cuts and bruises. He went on to say that he had picked Mexico as the scene of the false killing because he thought the story would be more difficult to trace. Like many citizens, he was unaware of the close cooperation between American law enforcement agencies and the Mexican authorities. We asked him about the existence of a Bruce Hamilton, and he told us there was such a boy in his class at school. 12.50 p.m. The communication had come through from San Francisco, and the teletype said that Mrs. Bradley was en route to Los Angeles to aid in the investigation. When we told Kevin about this, he lapsed into silence, and for another hour refused to say anything. 2.05 p.m. All right, now look, boy, you've been sitting there for an hour, and you haven't said a word. If there's something you want to say, we'll listen. There's nothing to say. I tried. Tried to get away from her. All my life she's told me what to do. I, I tried to tell her, but I couldn't. Nobody would understand. You don't. You can't. Every time I tried to get away, she'd say something or do something so I couldn't leave. I was trapped, and I didn't know what to do. Then I thought I did know, and even that didn't work. I thought that if you told her I was dead, she'd forget me. Leave me alone. I can't even die right. Kevin, you're here. I knew what they told me was wrong. I knew you were all right. Hello, Mother. What happened to you, Kevin, darling? Your face, your clothes. Oh, my poor baby, how did this happen? Are you all right? Oh, your poor face all cut. What's happened, Kevin? It's all right, Mother. No, it's not all right. I don't know what happened or who did this awful thing, but I'll take care of it. Officer. Yes, ma'am. What do you know about this? I beg your pardon? What do you know about this? Did you do it? Did you hit this poor boy? Look at this poor face. Just look at it. It's terrible. That's what it is. It's terrible. I mean to find out just what happened here. I'll get to the bottom of this. No, don't you worry, Kevin, baby. Mother's here. She'll take care of you. Mother, please. Oh, it's all right, honey. Everything will be all right. Mother, these officers had nothing to do with it. Of course not. If you say so, Kevin, baby. Have you called the doctor about this? Have you gotten in touch with someone to take care of his face? Never mind. I'll take him to a doctor. I'll look after him. 
Poor baby. Mother will look after him. Mother, please don't. Now, Kevin, you know that Mother knows what's best. Mother will take care of it. Stop it. Stop it. Shut up. Kevin. I'm sick of it. Tired of it. For 20 years, as long as I can remember, you've taken care of things. Did you ever think I might want to take care of a few things myself? Have you ever thought that I wasn't a kid anymore? I'm an adult. Like it says on the missing report, male, white, American, 22 years, an adult. All right, take it easy, son. No, I've, I've tried to say this before, and I've never had the nerve. I've got it now, and I'm going to finish. I'm tired of having you make all the arrangements for me. I'm going to have dates with girls that I want to go out with, not the ones you pick for me. I'm going to get a job and make my own way. I'm going to buy a car, and if I smash it up and me along with it, it's my business. I'll never forgive you for what you've done. You spent 20 years making me an outsider, always on the fringe. I couldn't do the things I wanted to, only the things you wanted me to do, only the things you thought best. I'm sick of having you make the decisions for me. From here on in, I'm going to make them myself. I tried to kill Kevin Bradley for no reason. You killed him a long time ago. Take a good look at me, Mother. Take a good look and see what you've done. I hate the sight of you. I hate everything about you. Now leave me alone and go away. All right, take it easy, boy. It's all right, officer. I understand. Sometimes he gets like this. He doesn't mean it. I know him. All right, Kevin. I'm sure the officers are impressed. Dry your eyes and we'll go home. Do you hear me, Kevin? Stop this foolishness, I said. We're going home. Yes, Mother, I hear you. I'm sorry, officer. Embarrassing. I don't know why he does these things. He's always been pretty emotional. Yes, ma'am. There's nothing else. We'd better be going. I want to catch the early plane back to the city. There's a party planned for tomorrow night. A million things to do. You'll have to help, Kevin. Kevin, do you hear me? Yes, Mother, I hear you. Well, then say goodbye to the officers and let's go. Goodbye, Mr. Friday. Mr. Smith. I'm sorry this all happened. Yeah, so are we, son. I tried, Sergeant. Just didn't work, but I did try. Kevin, let's go. I don't want to miss that plane. Yes, Mother. Uh, oh, Sergeant. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you for giving my boy back to me. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On August 9th, the matter was taken before the city attorney for a decision. In a moment, the results of that decision. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, if you're planning a trip this coming holiday weekend, I'd like to suggest that you take Fatima's along with you. Get a carton or two, and that way you'll have enough to last the trip. In Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality that gives you extra mildness and a really different flavor and aroma. You get an extra mild and soothing smoke, plus the added protection of Fatima quality. That's king-size Fatima in the bright, sunny yellow pack and carton. In the interest of justice, there was no complaint filed against Kevin Allen Bradley. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Herb Ellis, Edwin Bruce, Sarah Selby. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. King Size Fatima has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Friday, hear the Mario Lanza Show on NBC.